Okay, hello. Um, ooh, I wanted to go over the final paper assignment. Um, I forgot to have it open. Okay, so oh, I need to have you see it actually. Is that legible? Sort of. Right. So uh, it's due on Tuesday during finals week. Um, six to eight pages long, double spaced. As I always say about those length things, you know, it's more, it's to give you an indication of how much of a paper it should be. I wouldn't like, I mean, don't try to fill it up with stuff to make it long enough or something. Um, uh, if you're worried about that, you can always insert a tiny little bit of space between every line or something. You know? <laughs> You have the right number of pages. Um, let's see. Uh, and but one week before that, so this coming Tuesday, the um, an introductory paragraph and brief outline of the paper is due. And then uh, I believe the TAs are organizing meetings to so you can you can get feedback on that. Um, I mean, you don't have to use the introductory paragraph or that, that you hand in or follow the outline that you hand in. Uh, on the contrary, I think, you know, good thing to do would be to get feedback on it and then change your mind about the, the outline and the, <laughs> and the introductory paragraph. But, um, but, uh, and okay, and it says here, and as it says on the syllabus, and I announced at the beginning. So this that in, that preliminary like draft outline assignment isn't it doesn't get a separate grade, but uh, you should hand it in and make sure it's not quote unquote wholly unsatisfactory, which is supposed to be a really really low standard. So just hand in something that actually is a first paragraph and an outline, even if they're bad. <laughs> um, and uh, because if you don't, then your final paper grade will be reduced. Um, okay, and the, so the assignment is, it's kind of open-ended, completely different from the first two assignments. Um, you really ideally are going to come up with your own point that you want to make and argue for it. Um, but uh, there's a whole list of topics here. Um, you don't have to follow one of those topics, but most people usually do. Um, but each one of these topics themselves is very open-ended, right? So it contains a lot of like sub questions. Um, but uh, not because you're supposed to answer every single one of those questions or something, but those sub-questions are supposed to, uh, like, 
suggest different directions you could you could go in thinking about this general topic. Um, so uh, I like to say it's kind of like choose your own adventure. You can kind of go through and say, oh, I want to go that way, and you know. Um, Right, so I'm not going to talk about those individual <coughs> suggested topics, although if there's any questions about them, you can ask me either now or later. Um, but just general things, okay, that I just said. Um, so all the topics are comparison topics, basically. So therefore, to answer them well, you have to talk about at least two of the people we read. Um, uh, probably talking about all three in a paper this short is, I mean, at least talking at length about all three in a paper this short is not advisable. Uh, I mean, of course, you, there always could, is room for just one sentence about something that might be illuminating. Um, uh, and let's see. Um, yeah, I don't recommend that you try to find uh, outside sources to ba base this on. Um, it's really, you know, intended to be your chance to try to figure, try to make some point about the text. Um, but, you know, if you do use outside sources, you're allowed to, but obviously please cite them properly and don't plagiarize. Um, so, uh, you know, and I think I said this at the beginning of the course and I said it, I'll say it again now that, you know, I we had, um, this year I've had more issues with plagiarism than in the past. Um, I guess somehow because of the pandemic is causing that. Um, just, uh, you know, uh, people, People basically never fail my courses if they actually hand stuff in unless they plagiarize and then are caught, and then sometimes they do. So, um, you know, it's probably not worth it. Also, I can say that plagiarized papers are usually not very good, so even if you don't get caught, you won't get a very great good grade. Um, so, you know, it's, it's better, like, if all you can think of is to uh, read Wikipedia um, or Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy or whatever and just copy in quotes, you know, put them in quotes and put footnotes and you won't fail. <laughs> um, now, let's see. Um, um, so I'm not encouraging you to write a paper on whether one of our authors is right or wrong or of the two of them, which is right. I think um, that's actually pretty hard to do well. Uh, and it usually requires, before you can do it well, to do well the other thing that I am asking, which is to try to figure out what the authors mean. So, um, so that's plenty hard. Often is more interesting anyway. I mean, it's in the end usually not hard to find some place where every interesting philosophical author is, is wrong. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, you know, we don't really read them because we think they're right about everything. We read them because we think what they say is interesting and important. And so, um, so actually figuring out what they mean is often much more important than figuring out whether it's right or not. Anyway, that's what I'm encouraging you to do, um, you know, and therefore I'm encouraging you to... Uh, as it says here, if there's something, if there's something in one of these authors that really rubs you the wrong way, you know, if you can use that as an excuse to really try to understand, okay, where could they be coming from to say this weird thing? But if you can't, and it's just like, no, this is just horrible. I, you know, can't deal with someone who says this. It's so stupid or evil or whatever. Then just write about something else. Um, and, uh, 
And this is just a note about how to write a good comparison paper. Now, like all of this, these, this is all about how to write a really good paper. You, you know, uh, um, it's like, you, you know, you don't have to do all of this. Certainly you don't have to do all of this to pass or, you know, even get a B or whatever. Um, but like, but ideally to be good, a, a comparison paper, it's supposed to mean that the comparison is interesting. So it means like you're trying to say something about something interesting about the relationship between the two authors. So like I do this all the time or try to do it. I don't know if you're actually interested, but I'm interested. <laughs> I do this all the time in lecture. Ray, I'll say, you know, okay, so what do Barclay and Locke actually disagree about here? So you know, that's a question that you can't, you couldn't answer that question by writing one paper about Barclay and another paper about Locke. It's intrinsically about the comparison. And if when you think about it, you realize it's not clear what they actually dis disagree about, then it's, you know, there's something to make a case for there. And that's the idea of a, that's the basic idea of a paper like this. I mean, it doesn't have to be what do they disagree about? Right? What, what do they really agree about? It can be, you know, um, what common assumptions make it necessary for them to be either one, you to be either one or the other, and there's nothing in between. There's various ways this can work, but that's the basic type of idea I'm looking at. And I'm looking for at least, you know, for the best type of paper. And um, yeah, there's no particular special format requirements or special you know a need for special formats for footnotes or anything like that if you're using the text assigned for the course you can just put the page numbers basically uh, if you're using a different edition or some other text you should put enough information that the TAs can figure out what you're referring to and that is that let's see if there are any questions any questions about that Okay, therefore I'm going to switch this back to this. Okay, so, um, it's a quick question in the oh, chat. yes, question. Should there be an intro and a conclusion? Well, I mean, uh, Yes, <laughs> um, you know, there's different ways of doing that. It doesn't have to be a long intro or a long conclusion. You know, there, so like uh, what, what an introduction and a conclusion do like in a real paper, um, like something that's published or whatever, they usually, the introduction kind of, um, explains why the topic is interesting and you should want to read about it or something like that. Um, not necessarily explains, but anyway, gives some idea to the reader of like what the context is, why are we talking about this, what's interesting about it. When you're writing a paper for an assignment, that's a little bit hard to do because the reason you're writing about it is because it's an assignment. <laughs> so, you know, um, but, so oftentimes shorter is better, I think. You know, like if the if the introduction is just a couple sentences saying, uh, like, at first it may seem that Barclay and Locke disagree about this, but uh, there are problems. You know, whatever. Like, it doesn't have to be an elaborate thing. It doesn't have to be a summary of the rest of the paper or anything like that. Although, I mean, so I guess having said that, I did say that part of the final, part of the preliminary assignment is the introductory paragraph. <laughs> um, so maybe it should be a little more than two sentences for that. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, 
there certainly is no need to start with something like this is this is almost an in joke among people who read undergraduate philosophy papers that like they always start from the beginning of time what philosophers have wondered about it, blah 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 you know okay yeah, i don't know if that's true or not but it's <laughs> you don't have to say it anyway just you know just i guess i put it this way just assume that your reader is interested in a comparison between these figures and start telling what comparison you're going to make um and for the conclusion you know if you have some uh reflections, uh, you know, a uh, larger message you can take out of the argument you made, um, uh, suggestions for where you would have to go to think about this more, all those things could go in a conclusion. If you don't have much like that, you know, um, I think you can just sum up the main point or something like that. Um, I hope that's I hope that's helpful. I there isn't just one right way to write a philosophy paper. Uh, I mean, even just thinking about the three people we've read in this course, their writing is is somewhat different, right? The way they organize things, how they would start a section, um, stuff like that. Uh, and therefore, I don't feel really impelled to try to teach a particular way of doing it. But, yeah, that's all I can say. All right. Any other questions? Okay. So I left this thing up about the vulgar versus the philosophers because I do want to talk about... Um, Hume's explanation of why we believe in the continued and distinct existence of external objects, which I don't remember. I don't. I think I barely got to it at the all at all at the end last time. Is that is that right? I think that's right. Anyway, if not, I might repeat myself a little bit. But um, so I mean, first of all, as I said, Hume in. Uh, the, the section, and this is so section two of part four of book one from last week's reading. In that section, after making this distinction between what the vulgar believe and what the philosophers believe, spends most of his time explaining this one because he thinks that this one just emerges from seeing the problems with this one. He says this one has no direct or original recommendation. Ray, like if we hadn't come up with this first, we never would think of this, he says. So what we first start to believe is that the very impression that's immediately present to the mind, the impression or idea, um, well, sorry, the, the idea that Locke would call that an idea, but but when it's strong and vigorous and such that you believe the thing is really there, Hume calls it an impression. And what we, what, what we tend to believe ordinarily is that the ver that very impression, it's immediately present to the mind. This is the place where I close my eyes. Um, then I open my eyes and there's an impression that exactly resembles the old one. And what we tend to believe is the reason it exactly resembles the old one is that the impression continued to exist even when I didn't perceive it. Um, so Hume says, like, the first thing we start to believe here in is the continued existence of our impressions even when they're not perceived. Then, because we believe in their continued ex existence, we start to believe in their distinct existence. That is, since they're, we start believing they're there even when they're not present to the mind, we are forced to think that they're not dependent on the mind for their existence. So there's something different from, there's something different from me, at least different from my mind. Um, 
it's something that can exist without it, because here it is existing without it. So, um, um, and then, like, as he explains, so he explains where that belief in continued existence comes from. Then he explains why when we start doing philosophy, we believe, we, we start to realize that uh, it doesn't make sense. That our, it couldn't be that our impressions have it. It's actually, it turns out that what doesn't make sense is we start to realize that our impressions couldn't have a distinct existence, distinct from the mind. That is, we start to realize that Barclay is right and our impressions, although not for Barclay's reason, Barclay is right and our impressions don't exist when they're not in our mind. So, um, therefore, we, Hume says, we should conclude that there's no continued existence, um, that there's no distinct and continued existence at all. But that's really hard because the imagination draws us so strongly by various principles to believe in this. So instead, to make ourselves feel better, we invent this fiction that there's another thing that resembles our impressions. It resembles this impression before I close my eyes. It resembles this impression after I opened my eyes. In between, it stays the same. And that's why these two impressions resemble, uh, resemble each other, because they both resemble the same external object. And this is basically Locke's view, right? So this external object causes me to perceive it, that is, causes me to have an impression that resembles it. Um, okay. So, like, in this week's reading, the ancient philosophy versus the modern philosophy, Hume talks about two different versions of this picture and explains why neither of them makes any sense. Uh, or rather, why the first one, the ancient philosophy, is just pure fancy, um, and the modern philosophy is not self-consistent. So it can't be true. Um, but uh, so that's in section three and four from this week's reading. But as I'm saying, in section two, he tries to explain where this belief in continued existence comes from. So um, So I think I did talk about this a little bit last time. It has something to do with the regularity of um, the sensations that we call external. So the sensations that we call external are the sensations of primary and secondary qualities, as opposed to passions, right, like anger, avarice, whatever, and um, uh, pains and pleasures. All of those are internal. We regard them as internal, and we don't think they have a distinct and continued existence when they're not present to the mind. Well, maybe now we do, because we believe in unconscious, or we tend to... to it's now become part of common sense, at least, I guess you would say, that there are unconscious passions. Um, but, uh, but that's not part of Hume's common sense. Um, it is part of Leibniz's, I guess. Well, anyway, never mind. Um, so, uh, right, so it's these external ones, Hume says, that we commonly believe have a continued and, and uh, distinct existence. Um, and the reason has something to do with their regularity. Um, but it's not actually that they're much more regular than those internal sensations. In a way, it's that they're less regular. So, like, what, what do I mean by that? Or what does you mean by that? So, like, let's draw the mind bigger here. So, 
like there's certain regularities about internal sensations, like uh, or that is passions, like pleasure and well. Yeah, sensible pleasure and pain are actually kind of an exception to this. And I have been confused in the past why Hume thinks we don't attribute a continued distinct existence to them. But anyway, stick with the passions, right? So there's like regularities to passion. So like after you feel hatred, there's one passion. You tend to feel anger. So like hatred tends to give rise to anger. Now this maybe isn't a perfect regularity, but insofar as it's a regularity at all, it's um, um, all the pieces are always there. You feel the hatred and then you feel the anger. Whereas take a regularity like from Hume's example, like, um, this is actually not a chronological sequence. Maybe I need a better example. Well, let me say, visible door closing. door slamming sound, right? So these are two external sensations or impressions. There's the impression of uh, seeing a door close quickly, and there's the impression of hearing the door slamming sound. So the regularity we're after here, so to speak, is that... Uh, we never hear this sound unless we also see this. Right? So those two go together. That's what we're after. But if you think about Hume's example, now Hume's example is a door opening, but you can do the same thing with a door closing. Um, you know, suppose I'm sitting in the room not facing the door and I hear a door slamming sound. So um, it's an exception to the regularity. There was no visible door closing in my mind, right? I had no impre visible impression of a door closing. I only heard the sound. So what the belief in the continued and distinct existence of impressions is going to do is say, well, yeah, there was a visible door closing. It just wasn't present to my mind. So, in other words, it's because the, these external impressions have a kind of regularity only if you supply certain missing pieces. That's why it's the case of the external impressions in particular where we tend to form this belief. Um, Right? Or as Hume says, this is um, part two, section 20 on page Now, let me start up here, actually. Our passions are found by experience to have a mutual connection with and dependence on each other, but on no occasion is it necessary to suppose that they have existed and operated when they were not perceived in order to preserve the same dependence and connection of which we have had experience. The case is not the same with relation to external objects. 
Those require a continued existence or otherwise lose in a great measure the regularity of their operation. So, um, now, I mean, at first you might think that uh, this is pretty easy for Hume to explain. And Hume, and Hume does consider this explanation first. You might think it's easy for him to explain. It's his usual principle of custom, right? So the, the idea would be that every time I heard the door slamming sound, I also saw a door close. So I associate the two with each other. And so now I hear the door close, but I don't see the door don't see the door close. So uh, due to the association, I supply the missing piece and I believe in it because of its connection to a present impression. Um, and if that were the right explanation, then all of our belief in the continued and distinct existence of um, our impressions would be um, just an example of reason in Hume's loose sense, reason from cause and effect. Right? It would all be part of the same um, reason that we believe in remote matters of fact. So if, you know, right, so if you say, like, why do we believe, um, uh, why do I believe that the table is still here even though I close my eyes? It's basically the same reason I believe there are people in China even though I've never been there. I reason from cause and effect. Um, but the the problem is, like, so all that reasoning from cause and effect, first of all, won't get started at all unless there's some basis in sensible knowledge for it to start with. And the basis in sensible knowledge can't be just hear a door slamming. The basis in sensible knowledge has to be there is such thing as a door, which looks a certain way and sounds a certain way and so forth. Um... Remember, this is why I said that Berkeley, even though he refutes skepticism in a certain way, in another way, doesn't refute it at all. Because, you know, what he, he proves we can be certain that there's a door slamming, an audible door slamming, when we hear it. But that's not what we need. What we need is that there's something that causes, like, all the different impressions we expect to get from a door. If you look at it, you'll see it, etc. So, um, uh, and that's just missing from our experience. And now Hume says, well, can custom fill it in? And the answer is no, not right away, because, um, like, so this is the way it's supposed to work. Every, every time I hear a door slam, I also see a door close. But it's not true, right? Here's an example where I heard the door close and I didn't see it close. How often does that happen? Well, it happens every single time I would need to fill in this missing piece. So there's exactly the, the rule that I'm supposed to be getting the habit from has exactly many exceptions as the number of exceptions I'm trying to cover. So um, what I'm trying to do is um, not extend a regularity that I've always experienced to one more case. What I'm trying to do is extend a regularity that is a 70% regularity to suddenly believing that it's 100%. And the 70% regularity can't give me a basis for that. <laughs>
So uh, I know that point is a little bit hard to understand. Let me, uh, it might help if I read Hume's explanation of it, or it might not, I don't know. But let's see. This is on the next page, on page 131, part, uh, book one, part four, section two, uh, paragraph 21. Um, For it will readily be allowed that since nothing is ever really present to the mind besides its own perceptions, tis not only impossible that any habit should ever be acquired otherwise than by the regular succession of these perceptions, but also that any habit should ever exceed that degree of regularity. Any degree, therefore, of regularity in our perceptions can never be a foundation for us to infer a greater degree of regularity in some objects which are not perceived. Right? So again, the regularity we start off with is not whenever I hear a door close, I also see a door closed. The regularity is about so-and-so percent of the time when I see a door closed, I also hear, I, when I hear a door closed, I also see a door closed. And um, from that, I'm supposed to be acquiring the belief that, it's, that it holds 100% of the time. And Hume says that can't just happen from the regular... Um, operation of the principle of custom. So obviously in the case of remote matters of fact, when we, like, why is that supposed to be different? Well, I think, you know, in the case where we're already admitting that there are all kinds of objects that I don't perceive, um, now I, you know, I can believe that the regularity uh, is always fulfilled. Um, but when I start without that, I, you know, I, I just start with sometimes it's fulfilled and sometimes it's not. Um, so this is basically, it's all like it's a huge overgeneralization. We believe that a certain thing always goes along with another thing, even though it manifestly doesn't. Sometimes it's there and sometimes it isn't. So Hume explains why we do this. So he says it's not just the usual principle of habit. It's other principles of the imagination. And there's basically two principles that he invokes. Or One is, he says, the, like the imagination has a certain inertia. This is, it's like a boat trying to stop, you know, it keeps going for a while after you turn off the engine. Um, so, uh, and the way that I think, as I understand it, the way that's supposed to work here is that a lot of times when um, one of the pieces seems to be missing, we look more carefully and we see that it's there. So if you observe more carefully, the regularity will become more um, apparent. So like if you're, uh, one thing is like if you're careful to always watch the door all day, <laughs> then that regularity would become much greater. Um, so um, it's, this is similar to what he says about precision in the stuff about mathematics. I won't go back into that, but I think, so the idea is that you, um, you form this idea of like, the more carefully you observe, the greater the regularity would be. But of course we can't observe 100% carefully. I can't see what's behind my head. You know, well, with a mirror, sort of, but, you know, I can't see, feel, hear, and smell everything all at the same time, right? So, um, so, um, and yet the imagination wants to keep going <laughs> and it keeps going. And the way it, the only way it can keep going is by saying, well, it's true. We can't observe everything carefully at the same time. But if you could, the regularity would be perfect. And then in order to explain that, you have to say, you know, therefore there's some things that we don't observe. There's always some things that we don't observe. <laughs>
So that's how it leads to the belief in impressions that aren't present to the mind. However, Hume says, and it's not, he doesn't really argue for this. He just says, I'm afraid that principle is too weak to account for the whole edifice of our belief in the external world. So he says, there's something else, another principle of the imagination here that's needed to explain why we're so strongly drawn to this belief. That even though, you know, in the rest of the chapter, he's going to argue that the belief is incoherent or that it, it, it's either um, obviously false or obviously f fanciful or downright incoherent. Um, nevertheless, once we stop reading the chapter, we're going to go back to believing in this again. Um, so there must be a very strong principle at work. Now, I mean, it seems like you need both of these principles because the other principle by itself, you might think, would apply to passions and internal sensations as well. Um, so I think you need this. This is why we only do it with external sensations, but then what makes it so powerful, what makes us really want to do it with external sensations is this other factor. And the factor is the confusion of identity with another relation. And in the simplest case, the other relation is just resemblance. So you go back to the case where I'm looking at something. I guess this was a pen that I drew before. I'm looking at this pen. Then I close my eyes, then I open my eyes. These two impressions, assuming nothing has happened to the pen in between, exactly resemble each other. So there's a relation between them, or rather, I guess, to put it more precisely, at this moment, there's a relation of exact resemblance between my present impression of a pen and my memory, my idea, my memory idea of a pen. These two exactly resemble each other. It looks just like I remember it looking before I closed my eyes. Of course, the question here is whether it, whether there's one thing, it, it looks like there isn't. It looks like there's two different things. The pen I saw before I closed my eyes and the new one I see after I close my eyes. The question is how we start thinking that it's the same. So the part of the answer is, well, you know, when I compare the present one to my memory of the previous one, they exactly resemble each other. Um, and then Hume says, we get that relation of resemblance mixed up with identity. So what is identity? You remember how Locke had a problem with identity. Did I talk about this last time at all? I'm having this deja vu feeling that I did. Is anyone here who was here last? <laughs> you must be. <laughs> Okay. I think you might have addressed it right at the very, very end, but not Okay, that. just very briefly then. So I'll talk about it again, still briefly probably, but... Um, right, so remember, like, um, let me erase these pens for a second and draw the oak, locks oak tree. Right, so, I mean, so, well, okay, so, I mean, first of all, just the basic question was, identity is supposed to be, or no, let me start this way. A relation, according to both Locke and Hume, is always between two things. It's a relation of one thing to something else. But identity, apparently, is supposed to be a relation between a thing and itself. Right? Everything is identical to itself and not to anything else. So there's various ways of dealing with that. There's Hegel's way, there's Frege's way, I don't know. There's different ways of dealing with that. But Hume and Locke both agree that this doesn't make sense. 
a, the mind can't take something out of itself to compare it with itself or something like that. There's only one thing here. They both say from one thing we get the idea of unity, not the idea of identity. So, um, and Hume, I think, explains this a little more clearly than Locke, but they're both asking the same question. They're saying, in, so identity seems to be, on the one hand, like every relation, it's supposed to be a relation between different things. But on the other hand, the different things are supposed to be the same, because that's what identity means, sameness. And again, please remember that, right? Identity here doesn't mean like my identity. My, you know, I identify as whatever. Identity means sameness, right? So the relation of identity is supposed to be a relation of sameness. We have two different things, and yet we want them to be the same. So how can there be a situation where you have two things, and yet there's only one of them, or one thing, and yet there's two of it? And here, too, Hume and Locke give almost the same answer. So Locke's answer is... Um, well, there really are two things. So here's an example. Here's an oak sapling at time t equals zero. And here's a big oak tree at time t equals, you know, whatever. D1. <laughs> Years later, right? So um, now, like, obviously, these are different. One is much bigger than the other, et cetera. Um, and yet they may be the same oak tree. So Locke says, basically, identity is a relation between two things at different times, one of which we um, take for certain purposes to be the same as the other or in a certain respect to be the same as the other. So in the case of the oak trees, um, we count something as the same as this oak tree if it's connected with it by a continuous living process of like nutrition and growth and whatever. Um, um, so they're really different. Uh, but for certain purposes or in a certain respect, they're the same. And that's how we get both sameness, identity, and difference in order to have two things to have a relation between. And on Locke's point of view, it looks like, I mean, this isn't 100% clear, but it looks like if you ask, well, are they really the same or not? The answer is, it really depends on your purposes. Right? Like, if, you know, if all of the matter in this oak tree, um, as we would say, like all the molecules or whatever that were in this oak tree in between during these years may have gone somewhere else and they may be completely new ones there. None of the original ones are there. And moreover, if we imagine, although this is unlikely, that all that stuff that left the original oak tree has now come back together to form a kind of blob here. <laughs> then um, this is the same mass of matter as this was. Let me draw it at the same time as the big oak tree. Right? So somehow, years later, all the, all the carbon and oxygen, of course, those things hadn't been discovered yet, but, you know, all the carbon and oxygen and whatever that were in this sapling and meanwhile have like flowed out into the environment, have been in the clouds or whatever, uh, now miraculously have all come back together to make one blob here. So this is not the same oak tree as that. It's not an oak tree at all. Even if it were an oak tree by a further miracle, it wouldn't be the same oak tree as this one because it's not connected to it by that, those processes of nutrition and growth and whatever. But it is the same mass of matter as this. So whether two things are the same really just depends on... Identity is relative to your purposes. This is Locke's solution. Hume's solution is almost the same, but it's the opposite. 
So Hume's solution is this. Now, you may remember from when he talked about the vacuum that he said something, you know, we have no idea of extension, but insofar as it's colored or solid. He said the same thing about time, that we have no idea of time other than um, what we get from a succession of changes. So suppose in between t equals 0 and t equals t1, a certain thing doesn't change at all. See, I can't even, let me not write t equals 0 and t. So, yeah, let me put it this way. Suppose a certain thing is not changing. As long as I focus on that one thing, um, there's no succession of changes. And therefore, I have no impression of time connected with that thing. It doesn't have different temporal parts, as people these days might say. It doesn't have an earlier phase and a later phase. It's just one thing. So, so far, we just have unity, not identity, right? So far, just as here, we started off, we just had difference, not identity. Here, we just have unity, not identity. Um, where do we get the difference that makes identity come from? And the answer is, Hume says, well, some other thing may be changing. So here's like a clock that's changing, right? You know, the... Um, hand is moving around the clock. So these are three different times. Assuming it's moving fast enough for me to perceive the change. If not, that's a little weird. Apart. But yeah, anyway, so these are three different times, right? Because I do get the idea of succession in time from perceiving this or, or imagining this. Um, meanwhile, all three of these could be simultaneous to this. That's a weird thing to say, but that seems to be Hume's view about this. Right? There isn't just, like, the time doesn't change in step everywhere. This thing went through three different times because it changed. This thing, it's all, it's all the same time because there were no changes. But now comes the fiction. By a fiction of the imagination, we take this as separated according to the stages of this other thing. And one other thing there always is, is our own mind continually changing, right? So even if I'm not seeing a clock or whatever, there's always something continually changing as long as I'm thinking. So, you know, I take one thing, one impression now we're talking about that's not changing, um, and I um, notice that it goes together with a bunch of other impressions or ideas that are changing. And so by a fiction, I take it to have these different parts. And this is the relation, so the relation of identity is the imaginary relation between these different, these imaginary different phases of an object that really only has one phase. Right, so here, if you ask, is it really identical or not? Um, there is an answer. The only thing that's really identical is the thing that's not changing at all, and therefore, I mean, really identical. The identity is an, like an imaginary relation, but, uh, but it's only properly based on this one situation where something is not changing and there's only one of it. Okay, so that's Hume's theory of identity. Are there questions about that? It's, it's weird. I mean, but, you know, it's another one of Hume's really clever and cool, weird things, but you may not find them cool because you may find them hard to understand. And he's always apologizing for that. Um, and uh, I think he did feel it was one of the reasons this book fell stillborn from the press because it contained too much of that stuff and people didn't like it. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, so that's Hume's theory of identity. Now, if we go back to our picture with the pen, 
So here's the two pen impressions. And in particular, here's the, like, the memory of this previous pen. And um, Hume says, in this transition here, my mind has basically the same feeling as it would have in this other situation where this pen impression just lasted the whole time. Right now, I mean, again, like the way Locke maybe would understand that is that there's a pen impression that has all these different pieces. It's not really the same. There's a pen kind of impression at this time, this time, this time, this time. But Hume says it's just one pen impression. And so as long as I'm focused on this impression, my mind isn't doing anything with respect to that. It's not making a transition from one thing to another. But in this case, so in this case, my mind did make a big transition from not seeing a pen to seeing a pen. But as long as I think about this previous resembling pen, then I put myself in a similar situation to this. I'm making a transition between two things. Yes, but they're two things that exactly resemble each other. So the transition is um, not noticeable at all. It is, I think it's not the same. You might think it's exactly the same as this because these resemble each other exactly. But remember, like, this has a different degree of vivacity because it's a present impression as opposed to this, which is a memory. So something does happen when my mind goes from one to the other, but not very much because the content of the impression stays the same. So it's very, very similar to the nothing happening that would be in this case. And Hume says, um, so, um, there's two confusions that happen here. Um, now I'm getting confused. <laughs> he says this is the exact thing you're going to get confused Oh no, I see, I remember. It's not two confusions. There's two relations of resemblance here. The first is this relation of resemblance. So this relation of resemblance makes it easy for the mind to pass from this memory to this impression and vice versa. But then there's another relation of resemblance, and the resemblance is between this whole situation and this situation. That is, between the real relation of um, exact resemblance between these two different impressions and the imaginary relation of identity, quote unquote, between this one constant impression. This is also a relation of resemblance, and so it's also easy for the mind to go back and forth in between these. And that's what it does. It goes from this to this. That is, it goes from what it really saw, which is these two separated but exactly resembling impressions to thinking that it saw this, a constant impression. Now, you might say, well, okay, but that's, you know, and sometimes Hume says, sounds like this is what he's saying. You might say, well, okay, but that's just wrong, right? I mean, they were two different impressions, not one. So the, so the mind, we would say, you know, has fallen into some kind of confusion, but uh, uh, it should be easily correctable. Just notice that they were two impressions, not one. But so the reason it's not easily correctable, and so, by the way, so according to Barclay, that would be right, I think. According to... According to Hume, it's not right because, um, and this is the key point, this is on page 137. 
So, um, it's book one, uh, part four, section two, paragraph 39. We may observe that what we call a mind is nothing but a heap or collection of different perceptions united together by certain relations, and supposed though falsely, to be endowed with a perfect simplicity and identity. So what Hume is saying is, as usual, we see no necessary connection between distinct ideas and impressions. We have one idea or an impression, at, that is, so I, quote unquote, have one idea or impression after another. But what does that mean? Like, what do I actually perceive? What is actually perceived, you might want to say, uh, in this mind? A succession of different ideas and impressions with no necessary connection between them. There are certain relations between them. They follow each other in certain regularity and so forth. And that's what makes me regard them as all belonging to the same mind. So this is Hume's um, theory of personal identity. And we'll see next time we read the appendix that Hume himself concludes that there's something wrong with it. But let's uh, not, or anyway, there's something puzzling about it. But without getting into that now, the point is, so if that's what the mind is, like in a sense, like I shouldn't have drawn this line here, so to speak. There's just a bunch of impressions, and they're related to each other by, it's because of certain orders that they go in and so forth. But if I look at each one by itself, there's nothing that tells me that it has to be with all those others in those relations. It could not be. So therefore, unlike Barclay, Hume says there's nothing absurd in thinking of an impression existing outside my mind or outside any mind, just by itself. Well, so in that case, um, it's not exactly right to say there clearly are two different impressions here. What's right to say is that all we have any ground for thinking is that there's two different impressions there. But if someone says, no, it was really one impression, it was just, it was in your mind at this point, bound to the others by certain relations at this time, but then it fell out of those relations, and then those relations came back, but it was the same thing intrinsically the whole time, then that's no more absurd than the idea of the pen impression just by itself. There's nothing absurd or contradictory about it. It's groundless. So in other words, the fiction that the vulgar view invents, that my impression was there all the time, even though, so it wasn't just my impression, basically. But the thing that was my impression when my eye was open continued to exist after my eyes was closed. And when I opened them, it came back into my mind. That thing that the vulgar, that assumption that the vulgar view wants to make is not contradictory or absurd. It's just, there's no basis for thinking that. Right? That is the only basis for thinking that was this confusion. But if the confusion is powerful enough, Hume says, that you know, imagination will take up this assumption as long as it's not absurd and contradictory and say, oh, this reconciles it, right? It looked like there were two, but I really want to think there's only one. Oh, it could be there's only one. Just assume this. And that's what Hume says that, that almost all of us do constantly all the time. Um, and that's why, you know, when I close my eyes and I open again, I don't think for a second that um, the things I see weren't there while my eyes were closed. <laughs>
And yet, unless I'm in a very philosophizing moment, I also don't think the things I see are different from my visual impressions. I think, I don't think I see visible impressions and the visible impressions stand for bodies outside my mind. I think I see the table directly, immediately. So that's this vulgar view. And then Hume says, the only problem with it is it's not absurd or contradictory, but it's false. And this is why I think I did talk about this last time. You know, just press your finger against your eyeball. All of a sudden, there's two of everything. Um, so if this were continued and therefore distinct from the mind, um, meaning that the reason I have these two resembling impressions is because this it continued from here to there. All of a sudden, I press my eyeball. Now there's two resembling impressions. They couldn't both be caused by the same thing still being there, because now there's two of them. Right? So, like, in other words, suppose I press my, my, press my eyeball right here. So instead of one, now I see two. They both resemble my memory of the previous one, but I can't explain them both as being this one just still there, because there was only one of these, and now there's two of these. So I want to explain, oh yeah, one of them is the thing that existed all along, and the other one was caused somehow by my pressing my eyeball. But um, these things exactly resemble each other. So it violates the our usual reasoning about law about cause and effect to assume that this one of them has one cause and the other has a completely different cause. So we can't, at least according to our usual way of thinking about cause and effect, on reflection we can't believe this assumption, even though it's not absurd. And that's what gives rise to the philosophical view. The philosophical view says, oh, oh, I see, right. So the impressions really were different. And they really, they didn't have a continuing existence, and they didn't have a distinct existence. They depended on my mind for their existence. But there's someone thing else outside that did exist the whole time. And that thing caused both of them. So now when you ask about this one, you're like, well, you know, under normal circumstances, this one thing causes this one impression. But under this unusual circumstance where I press my eyeball, it causes two impressions, and that's the end of the story. There's no, um, uh, I mean, it's not the end of the story. You actually say more about it. Like, it's because my, you know, this is what my eyeball did and whatever. You know, another, and, and Locke would talk about that part of the story, presumably. But the main point is, there's no problem with assuming that one cause sometimes has one effect and sometimes has two effects. The problem is with looking at identical effects and inferring completely different causes for them. And this avoids that. So the problem is, with it is, though, that although it avoids it, well, there's two problems. One is the one he said at the end of section two, namely, that although it avoids the problems with the vulgar view, it doesn't really have, there's no reason to believe it. We would never believe it. If we just, if you said, here's two things that exactly resemble each other, that gives you no reason to believe that there's a third thing that resembles both of them, that caused both of them. The only way we get from that to, to the assumption of this third external thing is by way of the vulgar view. When it turned out to be false, but we, 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 we felt like we couldn't say that there's no continuing and distinct existence, right? Like, I don't want to, after I discover this is false, say, okay, the table does disappear when I close my eyes. Well, I mean, Barclay does say that, right? But Hume says, that's where Barclay is wrong about common sense. Common sense will never stand for that. 
Um, so, you know, we can't believe that, even though in a certain sense Barclay is right and we should conclude that, but we can't and we don't. And therefore, we invent this other story, but therefore this other story is just like its only basis is a confusion we made and then trying to cover it up, <laughs> essentially. That's one problem with it. But the worst problem with it is that at least on the way Hume's, Hume, ways Hume knows of actually working it out, it has further problems. And okay, so I'm going to stop here because now I'm going to talk about the ancient philosophy and the modern philosophy. But are there questions about any of this so far? Okay. So, um, so the ancient philosophy is basically Aristotelianism. Um, you know, uh, it's not, I think, not clear to Hume and still not clear now whether this is, a, which parts of this are actually Aristotle's original view, but, um, but roughly speaking, the, you know, the, all the parts that he collects together here are things that ancient and or medieval Aristotelians, well, or early modern Aristotelians, um, uh, tended to believe, and they thought that's what Aristotle meant. So, you know, it's not important for these purposes whether Aristotle really meant it or not. Um, oh, wait, there was another thing I was going to talk about first, but maybe, you know, I'm going to skip the, the other thing and talk about, go on to talk about this because I'm on time. So, um, Whereas the modern philosophy is what I before called mechanism, and it's basically Locke's version of it. There's many different versions. Uh, I think Hume thinks similar arguments will apply to all of them, but you know, he mostly has, seems to have Locke in mind in this discussion. So. Um, I'm not going to say that much about the ancient philosophy because we mostly haven't discussed the contents of these Aristotelian views in this course. Um, but um, basically, so the way the these Aristotelians think about external objects is that they consist of substances and their accidents. Um, Hume's terminology is a little weird, and I'm not sure where he got, got it, but you know, normally you would think that these sensible substances are composed out of matter and substantial form. Um, Hume actually calls matter substance. That's a little bit confusing. Uh, it doesn't really matter unless you want to get into the details of what he's talking about. So let me just forget about that and talk about substance and accidents. So, you know, there's, there's kind of two big parts of the Aristotelian theory of substance and accidents. One is that... Um, Substance is the permanent subject of change. So like the typical example is, you know, Socrates at one time is white. And at another time, well, they say at another time he's black, but let's say dark, you know, or 
So this apparently means he's blushing or he's tanned or I don't know exactly, but this is the example they always use. So anyway, the point is, um, so um, the, like the ancient, the like pre-Socratic paradoxes of change were things like this. The white can never be black. It's called this is Socrates. So the white can never receive the black. But this is the white. Therefore, it can never receive the black. Therefore, Socrates can never change from white to black. And by the same argument, all change is impossible. So the Aristotelian solution to this is to say that to split Socrates into two parts, the substance, Socrates, which, and because shape and other things turn out to be an accident, accidents, you can't necessarily draw this exactly, but there's a substance that continues exactly the same. And, but it, it's accidents change over time. That's one part. And the other part is substance as, or substance slash matter as, I guess I could say that just as well for the other. Let me leave that. Substance as the ultimate subject of predication. So in this case, we're thinking like, um, what is white? Uh, extension. What is extended? Something, a substance, right? Something, I know not what, is the way Locke ends up characterizing it. You may remember. So Hume says, you know, why believe in these things? And the answer, he says, is basically the same kind of confusions that we saw, that we just saw before, only rather than their like regular working out, it's like an irregular, strange uh, instance of them. So like one is that suppose instead of exact resemblance, I have... Um, a gradual succession of impressions that change slowly one into the other. So the first one is really white, and then I wrote W minus, like a little bit less white, and the next one is a little bit less white, and finally you get to a, to a black one. So uh, Hume says, this also is fairly similar to the impression we would have if we were looking at something constant that wasn't changing. We don't notice the change that much. It changes by gradual degrees. Um, it can't literally be continuous, according to Hume, I guess. There always has to be sm a smallest step. At least it seemed like before he thought that about cases like this as well as about extension. But anyway, the steps are very small, and so we don't notice them that much. And so again, we confuse this with the case of something constant. But of course, here, if we, like, when we get to the end, and we compare the state we were in with the memory of the original state. So instead of just going through the process, we stop and consider two different stages of it, then the, it's very different from observing a constant object. There's been a change from white to black. So we can't believe that it was really the same thing. And yet we want to believe it was really the same thing. And so for this, what we invent is the idea that... Um, There were two things. One of them stayed the same, but we didn't see that. <laughs> right? Like, and this is kind of, I think, supposed to be a variant 
Well, no, it's supposed to be a variant of the philosophical view, I guess. Hmm. Or it should be considered a variant of the Vulcan view. It's not really set, but I'm wondering that after the first time. But anyway, we didn't see this one, right? What we saw was these ch this change from white to black. But we believe there's something that was the same there the whole time. Due to a confusion, we believe it. So we think, oh, there was something there that we couldn't see. And that thing had these supported, gave the ground to these other things that we could see. So, right, that's where this part comes from. Oh boy, I better wrap this up. And the other part comes from something similar. It's, you know, it's another effect, but an irregular effect of constant conjunction. We always see these properties together. So we start to believe that they're necessarily connected with each other. But a little philosophical reflection shows us that they're not necessarily connected to each other. Each one is conceivable without them. So like the taste and the smell of an apple or something like that. Each is conceivable without the other. So in this case, we say, oh, there must be some simple thing. Sorry, I should say, so, so no, I explained that wrong. It's another, here's the effect of constant conjunction, but it's, again, it's an irregular effect. We see these things together so much that when the mind sees one, it doesn't notice very much that it has to make a transition to get to the other. And so it starts to think of them as if they were just one thing. But then it notices they're not just one thing. So this, if I had more time, I could compare this helpfully to what Locke and Barclay say about the unity of complex ideas. But I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to say, right, so we take it as if it is one thing, but then when we look at each property separately, we realize it's two different things. And so again, we invent something else, something that really is just one thing and simple. We don't observe that thing, but it somehow is the ground for these others. And that explains this part. So, um, you know, there's a lot more detail in this section, but I really want to get onto the modern philosophy part. So I'll just say... Um, you know, so Hume ends up with saying, uh, look, I mean, um, I guess there's no, I, guess, I think he believes there's no contradiction in believing in this stuff. But he does think it's unintelligible, like that we don't know what this relation of support or grounding is supposed to be. So uh, we're kind of telling a story in words. We're not contradicting ourselves, but we're not exactly saying anything either because we don't know what the word support means. So actually, I mean, it's worse. It's, it, it's based on principles of irregular principles of imagination, like the kind of things that operate. Remember, he says, even in a dream, there's a certain order to our ideas, but it's obviously not a rational order, even in the loose sense. It's some kind of wild, irregular order. And Hume says the same type of principles are operating here. And so first of all, it's completely baseless. And second of all, the things it makes you believe in, um, it doesn't exactly give you something to believe in. It just gives you some words to say that you hope someone else knows what they mean or something like that. So this is, so, you know, and once that's um, exposed, the idea is that this view will not be at all attractive anymore. So contrast it with the modern philosophy. And Hume says, right, so the modern philosophy says, um, we're not going to give in to any of those irregular, um, you know, like tendencies of the imagination or anything like that. We're just going to go with what we actually see and what reason reveals about it. Um, 
But in this case, it's definitely supposed to be a version of the philosophical view, right? So they start off with the assumption. And again, this is supposed to be Locke. They start off with the assumption that we have different impressions um, that are could potentially are all of the same object. But that the object and that the object resembles them but is not the same as them. And the impressions can be interrupted, but the object continues. And then the question is: okay, in what respect? Do the impressions resemble this object? So that sounds familiar, right? That's Locke's distinction between primary and secondary qualities. The primary qualities resemble the object. The secondary qualities don't resemble the object. Hume himself, in the part on space and time, also assumed that the primary qualities resemble the object. I guess he also assumes that color resembles the object. That's how he avoids the paradox he gets here. Um, but but that probably just again means that that what he says in that section about space and time is um, not supposed to hold up to the stricter skepticism that he discusses in part four. Um, so anyway, so the modern philosophers ask themselves, okay, in what respect do my impressions resemble the object, and in what respect do they not? And they say, well, take color for existence. For, for example, the same thing looks different colors when I'm in different states, you know, uh, or to different people, or to the same person from different points of view. So let's, to make it easy, let's talk about the case where the same thing looks different colors to me at different times for whatever reason. So to all appearances, this thing has not changed. And what I mean to all appearances, by the laws of cause and effect, there's no basis for it to have changed, something like that. And yet, at this time, it looked red, and at this time, it looks blue. So, um, suppose that my impressions resembled their objects in color. Well, then this thing would have to have been red at this time. And it would have to have been blue at this time. But we assumed it hadn't changed. <laughs> so, that can't be. So therefore, at least one of these doesn't resemble the object. Now, like at this point, you would get, if Barclay says somewhere about this, the, the, oh, I see it's kind of not focused there. As Barclay says, what you really should conclude, it seems, is that although it may be some color, you don't know which. Maybe it's red, maybe it's blue. Um, um, but of course, uh, Hume is going to say that violates our usual reasoning about cause and effect. Again, for the same reason he said before, we have, you know, um, one of these cases doesn't resemble the archetype and the other does, and yet to all appearances they're the same as each other. So um, we can't, you can't say, oh, this one is red because the object is red, but this one is blue for some other reason. Right? That is, um, we have similar effects, but we're attributing to completely different kinds of cause. Now, like, I mean, whether this would hold up 
in every case is not so clear, but at least there's some cases like the water feels hot to one hand and cold to the other hand, um, where, you know, the two hands are in exactly the same position. It's true, one of them was just somewhere hot and the other was just somewhere cold, but that's also symmetrical, right? Like if you ask which one resembles, there's nothing to choose one or the other. Maybe in that case, we have a reason to say the real temperature is in between. I don't know. There's also the case of dreams and illusions and something like that, something like that where at least supposedly they sometimes, but is this really true, exactly resemble waking perceptions? Um, I don't know. So th this, this step is a little bit unclear, but he says, you know, it doesn't make that much difference because... He's going to use this to say, okay, I'll give you this luck. The secondary qualities don't resemble the object. And that leaves over the primary qualities. So now we've got down to the primary qualities. The primary, primary qualities are motion, figure, extension, solidity, that's number, although he doesn't really talk about that here. He mostly talks about, actually, he mostly talks about number, motion, extension, and solidity. So now we're assuming, and this is Locke, that the properties that external bodies really have are on this list. But Hume says, well, so first of all, motion. Something can't have motion unless it's extended and figured. And I think a simple thing could have motion, but that's not gonna that's not gonna get lock anything. So let's say uh, include zero extension here, even though elsewhere he doesn't. Something can't have motion unless it has figure and extension. So we have to, if we want to explain what we mean by saying that external bodies have motion, we need to explain what we mean by having, that they have figure and extension. So he says, everyone agrees with this. You can't have motion by itself. And also, I guess that you can't have figure without extension. But he says, I showed in part two that you can't have extension without color or solidity. So if we want to explain what external bodies are, um, motion is only going to make sense if we already understand them as having a shape. Shape is only going to make sense if we already extend, ext understand them as having a size. And size and shape are only going to make sense if we can understand them as solid or colored. But of course, color is off the list because it's a secondary quality. So explaining what external objects mean are comes down to explaining what solidity is. But Hume says solidity, and this is not exactly Locke's definition, but I won't, I'm already out of time, I won't have time to talk about the differences and what they reveal. But Hume says solidity means that one body resists another body coming into its space. Okay, so what resists what? There has to be a difference between this and this. Otherwise, I couldn't tell whether this one was in this one's space or not. That's the basic argument. So, like, now, of course, these lines, what are these lines? These lines are lines between something and something else. Again, what? Between what and something else? You could say it's between what and nothing, but still, it can't be between nothing and nothing. Right? So these lines themselves don't do us any good unless we can say what's inside the lines. Something that's inside this line can't be inside this line as long as this other thing stays there. 
Well, what are those things that fill in the space inside those lines? And Hume says, well, they have to be either color or solidity. If you say there's solidity, then you're in a circle, right? Because we're trying to explain what solidity is. But if you say they're color, you're back with a secondary quality. And that's why he says the modern philosophy is not only um, uh, false or unintelligible, but actually inconsistent, right? There could be no such things as what the modern philosophers call bodies. Um, Okay, I obviously could say more about that, but we're out of time, so I will see you on Thursday.